Hello everyone and welcome back to another edition of Kavam. It's episode 9, I can't quite believe it, we've been going for about 6 months nearly now, which is absolutely bonkers. Um, thank you guys for all the, you know, support, the views, subscribe, subscriptions, followers on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all that. Like, I've been checking the listening stats and actually they're pretty good. There's quite a lot of you listening, so that is really, really brilliant. Um, of course, if you're new here and you don't know quite what this is all about, Kavam is a podcast where we talk about Doctor Who, but we talk about the Blu-rays, the DVDs, the animations, the physical releases of Doctor Who, the documentaries, all the special features, archival content, all that side of Doctor Who that I don't feel like any other podcast really properly covers. Um, so I thought there's a gap in the market and me, Ryan and Charlie, we sit here and chat. So hello, Ryan and Charlie. How are you guys doing? I'm doing good. Um, all well and dandy. Uh, how about you, Charlie? Is everything all good with you? Yes, thanks. I've um, rewatched Web of Fear and um, not really much changed, but um, <laughs> yeah, I've, pre-ordered, um, I've pre-ordered Evil of the Daleks and I'm looking forward to that. Indeed. You, you got to the end of the story, though. Was the story itself a good one in the end? So I remember you only watched half of it when we last spoke. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Like that whole fight, uh, that whole battle scene with Unit and the Yeti in episode oh, four or five was yeah, fantastic. It's, yeah. it's that's one of the best, one of the best, uh, certainly one of the best sixties action scenes in Doctor Who. Mm. I think like probably one of the mm. best overall. But in terms of, like a proper big out location filming unit action moment, it's it's brilliant, mm. isn't it? Seeing them shoot down all the Yetis and with the music that was, I think music from Tomb of the Cybermen as well, which kind of fits, kind of doesn't. Oh yeah. Um, the space adventures thing I, that's I think was originally used when we see the Cybermen come out of the tombs in Tomb of the Cybermen. Mm. But, but also actually suits quite well with this scene as well. It's, yeah, no, you're right. It's really brilliant, even if the animation isn't. But of course, if you <laughs> haven't already heard that, listen to our previous podcast where we, we slated the Web of Fear animation for half an hour. So that was great fun. Um, but today we're talking about hopefully some rather better animations in Evil of the Daleks and Galaxy 4. So stick around for our discussions on those. But first, we wanted to just have a quick little chat about Series 13 and what's coming up because... We are still a Doctor Who podcast, even if we focus more on the Blu-rays and the classic Who and all of that. We are a Doctor Who podcast, so we're not going to avoid the current show. Uh, and Series 13 is coming at some point this year, a six-episode series. Um, we still don't know when, uh, even though we really thought we would by now, because we're in towards the end of September, and we thought, you know, maybe Halloween would be an air date, something around there, but yeah, we're still waiting. Uh, but of course, this week it came out the um, Find the Doctor, hashtag Find the Doctor, this sort of marketing scheme that um, they've been running since the first teaser trailer, which I think was in July. Was it July, guys? I think something like that. Um, yeah, a couple of months ago, where there's been the, these little hints of letters of a password in all these different sort of um, online things in like art, sort of artifacts in museums and stuff like that. Like it's probably they went for it. They really spread it over lots of different places and tried to make it really complicated and fun and interesting. Um, and they did that. And it's been I haven't been following it that closely personally, but it's certainly got people talking, I think, um, and people seem to genuinely have been interested and engaged in it as an idea. Uh, but unfortunately, this week, as seems to happen with many Doctor Who related things, is just before the end or just before they're announced, they leak. Um, I think I saw there was an action figure leak today as well, but I won't go into that. Um, and so I think we had about three letters of this password left. We got a, um, in Doctor Who magazine, there was some sort of QR code which took you to a website. Um, and the website where you entered the password had basically been updated this week so that you could find the, in the source code for the website, the actual password. And so somebody clever put it in and we skipped to the end of Find the Doctor. Even though the clip this week from DWM was just, I think, all of the main cast saying, for, saying are you, are you, have you found the Doctor yet? Or are you still going on with the adventure or something? Like, something like that. Um... And it was just a little bit underwhelming what we actually got, because spoiler alert if you haven't seen this, um, but essentially the end of Find the Doctor is just a 30 second video, well basically audio clip of the Doctor replying to Yaz's phone call video message from a few weeks ago, um, which doesn't give you any, it's, it's, you know, it's fun, it's nice, but it doesn't give you any like content, it doesn't give you anything to do with series 13. Um except for the very end of the video, which has two sort of split second flashes um, of picture, which show what I think we think is a Centaur or Centauran. I mean, again, spoiler alert, filming pictures from about 10 months ago told us there is a Centauran in this series. So it's not a mu- too much of a stretch to think these might look like a Centauran, um, which is cool, but also it's slightly underwhelming way to end a like two three month marketing sort of scheme it wasn't even with like a release date or an actual trailer it was with a little a picture uh an audio conversation with a doctor and a one second flash of a returning monster so well ryan i know you didn't know too much about this actually you'd managed to avoid the 
sort of leak, I guess. Have you been following the Find the Doctor kind of concept and marketing idea closely over the last couple of months? Yeah. Yeah, it I think it's difficult to get excited about Series 13 as much as there's, you know, leaks, as you say, of the Centaurans or the Weeping Angels and other things, but we don't need to spoil everything. Um, it just doesn't feel like you can get excited about this because they haven't told us anything. They released a 30-second trailer last couple of months ago, and yet it was the, like most contentless trailer i've ever watched it's just like shots of close-up shots of the companions and the doctor and them going oh no oh what's a, what's happening ah which doesn't tell you anything it and there's some guy from game of thrones who isn't really that famous unless you've watched game of thrones you know he's like it's cool but also is he really that is he really that big a guest star i don't know uh charlie i don't know do you feel like this find the doctor thing it's kind of come to a bit of an underwhelming end with just a short clip and a picture basically yeah 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 Yes. Yeah, it's 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 finding that balance, and I think series twelve was closer to that balance. But my concern is that series thirteen, with how few episodes there are, and the amount of returning monsters we know there are going to be, you it almost feels like every episode is going to just be a another returning monster. Not maybe not quite, but you know, it it feels like it's heading towards that extent. I mean, I feel like I don't know, maybe series eight, something like that was also quite big on that. You know, you had the Daleks, the Cybermen and the Master all in one series. But then they did that they they almost did that in series twelve as well, I guess, where you had well resolution and revolution either side of it had Daleks in. And then you had the Master and the Cybermen within the series. And the Jadoon, um, and Captain Jack. And so it's I don't know. I don't know what the answer is really. May I feel like it's it's safer to, to bring back monsters for Chris Chibnall Doctor Who because he because we can't be that confident in his writing and that he's going to come up with great new monster ideas and things whereas if you know you're throwing in Centaur and Weeping Angels they can't be that bad stories surely I mean with um, series we all mentioned with um, Return Masters I mean when they announced series 11 wasn't going to have any Return Masters I was kind of interested because I was like yeah. I wouldn't mind if there were no Return Masters if the stories were good well, the problem is most of the stories in Series 11 weren't that good. And so it didn't really surprise me that in Series 12 they were going to bring back all the monsters. I mean, I re it was really interesting what they were going to do with the Cybermen because I do like the, the concept of the lone Cyberman yeah. and what he added to the Cyberman mythology. But then, of course, we got to the Timeless Children and they just completely threw all of that out of the window. It's, yeah. again, the Master Show again, which is just, that one of the reasons why the Timeless Ch Children just frustrated me so much was the fact that they 
kind of spoil one of my favorite monsters and a great interesting concept yeah. that they had. And it's just, I hope they don't do the same with the um, the Sontarans or the Weeping Angels. I'm just really hoping they don't. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the concern. I feel like particularly with the Weeping Angels, because they've only ever been written by Stephen Moffat. We haven't seen them in the show since, well, I guess technically in Time of the Doctor and technically Hellbent, but as a like main villain of a story, not since uh, Angels Take Manhattan, which is what needs to be nearly 10 years ago or nine years ago, certainly. Um, so, I mean, it's a good opportunity to do something new with them. I'm sure there are good other, other good story opportunities. It's just whether Chris has taken them. Because I don't feel like we really know even like basic things like who's writing the episodes for this series. Like, is Chris just writing them all? Or is he like co-writing them all with other people? Or because it's all one story, is it possible that he's kind of basically written all of it just with a little bit of help from some other writers? I don't know. You know, things like that can have a big impact on the kind of feel of the show. It's, yeah, that's an interesting one. If Chibnall's writing all of it, that is going to be very concerning. <laughs> Maybe that's why they won't tell us anything about it, because they're too scared to tell the fans that he's written every episode. Mm. I, think, um, I don't think Chibnall's that bad as a writer. Like, there's definitely worse. Like, you know, he. I don't think he's written the worst of series 11 and 12. No, that's like, true. Um, Orphan 55... In my opinion, The Witch Finders, not many people liked Rosa, Arachnids in the UK. I don't know, I feel like he's written some quite good ones, like um, Revolution of the Daleks, uh, Ascension of the Cybermen. I believe he wrote that. Yeah, um, Spyfall yeah. wasn't bad. Yeah, yeah Spyfall. Spyfall was pretty good. But, yeah, yeah, he did like... I mean, there are some solid stories, I will agree. I mean, I do like Ascension of the Cybermen, Spyfall, and these two Dalek stories were pretty decent, but mm. then I'm just kind of left burned by both the Battle of Ranskor yep. Afkalov and the Timeless Struggle, which I think mm -hmm. are both absolute abominations. And they're both series finales as well, which is, makes it even worse. So I think it's because I'm being burnt so badly by those two stories that I really have absolutely no faith. I mean, Battle of Ranskor Afkalov might be my least favourite episode out of all of modern Doctor Who. Not yeah. the worst ever, but out of modern Doctor Who, the Battle of Ranskor is probably my least favorite <laughs> it's 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 very low on the list for me too it does feel like the, the nadir of chris Chibnall doctor who it's just mm. everything about it uh, isn't what you want from a series season finale which i think is the biggest problem yeah checking on imdb um battle of ranscroft Colossus is the worst rated new who episode ever there we go well yeah. not classic who classic who <laughs> classic who i believe was underworld part three. Oh, it, i mean underworld oh. is pretty awful um, yeah. i know obviously like the twin dilemma and time lash are also down there but um yeah underworld is pretty 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 low on those i feel like that like part three is one of the ones where like nothing happens as well it's one of those episodes of classic who where mm. nothing happens for 25 minutes and it's also an awful story and it just yeah it's one of those um I mean, underworld has a good concept but it's just so boringly executed yeah. i mean they, they're the seed of an interesting idea i just wish they just did something better with the execution rather than just have really shoddy CGI caves. <laughs> yeah, it was just, it's, yeah, it's just really bad, isn't it? There's no, no, way, no way around it. It's just really bad. Um, so the Chris Chimler era of Doctor Who, speaking of things that are just really bad. No, I shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> so series 13 is coming at some point in the future. Um, it'll be six episodes. We think Find the Doctor wasn't great. Centaurans are good, but whether the series is easy to get excited about i feel like it's a struggle at the moment maybe by the next podcast we might have a release date and then that might start to get us a little bit excited um at least knowing when it's going to be on and maybe a trailer or something um but that is something that is happening this year whether we're looking forward to it as much as other things like evil delights and galaxy 4 that's the question um but we might as well segue on to some classic who let's go to a safe space of classic who animations where we can all come together in our enjoyment unless it's the web of fear um and say how much we really enjoy them um so evil of the daleks of course is being released um a week today hopefully you listen to it on the 27th of september uh we thought we'd just have a quick preview of it a discussion of what the extra features on it are and you know our just general thoughts on evil of the daleks um I think it's fair to say, as a story, it's one of the best Patrick Troughton stories in, in Doctor Who. Um, I feel like, um, for me personally, up until now, I've always preferred Power of the Daleks over Evil of the Daleks, but I think that's partially because there has been an animation of it to watch, so I've been able to see like a visual version of it rather than just the reconstructions in one episode. So I feel like this could be the time of getting the animation where like my opinion changes and actually it shifts to Evil of the Daleks, because I feel like 
fans in general slightly lean towards evil being better than power um but obviously they're both really really good stories but i feel like evil's maybe slightly the more popular one i don't know charlie have you seen evil of the daleks before have you been able to um form an opinion on it yet i've watched the first um couple of episodes of the reconstruction i haven't got around to watching the rest because i do find it quite difficult to get into the recons yeah but um it's really good like yeah. seriously i do genuinely enjoy it um victoria um is a good companion it's it's a pretty solid story what about you ryan i mean i remember buying the audio cd of it many many years ago when i was starting to get into doctor i remember buying the the audio soundtrack of it and it is still a really solid dark story definitely one of the best stories of the 60s and mm. one of Trout's best um i um i think it's a, just a really just interesting take on the Daleks about them trying to give a way of cat of defeating humans after being defeated by them for so long and just trying to tap into the human factor and how that factors into what's going on with the Daleks. And then of course, um, the whole, when they, the action moves to Scarrow in the last, um, at the, in the last two parts and you see the emperor and it's just like, it just takes it to a whole nother level of the fact that, they actually introduce an Emperor Dalek for the first time. And it's just, it, even on audio, it's just, it just, it do, you do feel the, the tension. You do feel like the, the anticipation. And I'm just can't wait to see how that gets translated into animation and seeing how the Emperor's portrayed. It's no surprising that Russell T Davis wanted to bring something similar back when he did um parting of the ways um in series one yeah totally i think it's it's gonna be really exciting to see how a story which in many ways has like such a grand scale to it obviously we go to scar and meet the dalek emperor and just seeing how that's fully realized in animation when you don't have the restrictions of sets of the 60s and all of that um with using a little bit of artistic license as they tend to with the animations i feel like they could really do a lot with that to create it into such a impressive visual spectacle and of course it's a really interesting behind the scenes of the story at the time because this was very much intended to be the final ever dalek story because basically at the time terry nation was wanting to basically take the daleks to america and start a tv show called the daleks or something you know a dalek tv show that's nothing to do with doctor who doctor who would never get the rights to use the daleks again he's wanted to make a lot of money um over in the states and so when they wrote this story it was basically how do we create a satisfying end for the daleks as car as, as a villain because we probably are never going to have the chance to use them again so i just think that's a really interesting backdrop to to going for this sort of bigger story where you introduce the emperor you have the whole sort of daleks being destroyed on scaro and, and going back going back to scaro and i think is this the first time we go back to scaro since the daleks i think it is isn't it yeah it is it, well, it, it was the we first don't see it in dalek master plan do we no, I I don't think we see it in Dalek Master Plan. I think it, with Dalek Master Plan, it was mainly on their base was primarily on the planet of I think it was called Kemble. That yeah, I think Kemble. Yeah, and um, so but yeah, it was the first time we saw Scarra since um, their very first story, which I think just adds more to that tend to the fact that yeah that this could have been their last story. So it's like they started on Scarra and they end on Scarra. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, th I think that just, yeah, gives it a really great sort of context and setting to it. And so this animation is obviously done by the same team who've done stories like the Macro Terror. Um, Charlie, are you, are you looking forward to this animation more than maybe you were with Web of Fear, knowing like we have a bit more confidence in the animation team based on what they've done in the past? Absolutely. I, I really do. Um, obviously, the team did um, Macro Terror, Faceless Ones, too insanely good animations like definitely my favorite of the lot so evil of the daleks is probably going to be up there with faceless ones and macro terror um also the fact that it's um seven episodes rather than just one in the middle of a story makes me more excited because currently we have you know little to no footage of this actual story you know in video form so mm -hmm. it will be nice to have this you know a whole seven episodes yeah exactly as, as you say kind of with although we've obviously got the episode two um with the rest of it you compare it to like galaxy four where we although we have an episode you also have like a six minute clip for another episode there's quite a lot of visual material there whereas with evil outside of that existing episode there's very little there 
Um, so it's just going to be great to see that realized on the screen in animated form. I mean, I'm, I, yeah, I'm certainly going to be watching it ASAP as soon as I get it um, to be able to really experience that story in the best way. And obviously, with all these releases, they give us, you know, a few special features. Um, so we've got the, the telesnap reconstruction to go with it. Um, an audio commentary. I don't think we know. Do, do we know who's on doing the audio commentary? I'm not actually sure. Um, but obviously they are doing one. I guess we'll have to wait and find out on that. Um, and then they've got the audio book with, Tom, uh, with the Tom Baker commentary. Was that the version that you heard in the past, Ryan? Was that the one you'd listened to? Uh, no, it was the basically just the audio of the episode, the oh, okay. audio soundtrack. Um, what I I have, but I am familiar with the. I've heard of about because I know he also did like an audio book for um, Power of the Daleks as well. So, which was on the the special edition of of that release. So, the fact that he's doing, um, they're also releasing this one as well is should be really interesting. Yeah, I think it's one of those ones from like the 90s. I'm just actually looking it up. Um, there was an audio book in 1992, I think it looks like it's the one. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, there we go. With with audio commentary by Tom, or sort of voiced by Tom Baker. Uh, two hours, 45 minutes. So we're going back 30 years to be able to have that version of it as well, which I'm sure for like people who are a bit older than us who were around at that sort of time to be able to listen to it, that's pretty quite a nostalgic like memory of this story because i think it pretty you know it's a classic like sort of uh audio cassette release from that sort of time that i feel like a lot, a lot of fans would have got hold of which is just always really really cool uh of course alongside that we've got i, I don't want to say usual but we've got a making of documentary which is always great um it's always really cool to hear the stories as as, as i mentioned i think the whole story about this being the final dalek story will be a great sort of starting point to kind of frame a, a making of about this story and i'm sure there's some great stories um about you know some of the set on scar and creating the emperor dalek and, and how that came about and of course the introduction of victoria as well um and her being introduced into the program i think there'll be some really really interesting points sort of picked up in a documentary there as well um i mean charlie you're looking forward to, to learning a bit more about the background to this story absolutely yeah like um for a story like this because obviously it introduces victoria it's the you know meant to be the final dalek story it's very big and epic in seven parts i'm probably more excited for how they go about making a making of documentary for it compared to some random, you know, story like, I don't know, Nightmare of Eden or something like that. <laughs> you know, I'm much more looking forward to this one because it's such a big story. Yeah, it totally, totally. And I think, I think it's, I'm really hopeful that it's just going to continue the momentum of the anima animation range, which yes, I know we had Web of Fear, but I feel like in general, the, the animations are really, just pushing on at a pace. Obviously, we've got Galaxy 4 announced as well, which we'll come on to in a minute. And I think it just it just ticks off another big box almost for Doctor Who fans of a really significant, important story that currently was so hard to watch is now going to be complete in animation form, which I just think is really exciting. Um, don't you don't you agree, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that it's as Charlie mentioned, this fact that it's done by the same team that's um done the faceless ones, Macro Terror. Also, Sharda and Power of the Daleks. Well, well, more specifically, the special edition of that one. Anyway, the less said about the original version, the better. Um, <laughs> the, the the fact that it's done by that team does have me um, really excited, and the fact that it will again further shows why this animation range is worth sticking around. I mean, even though Web of Fear was a little a little bit of a bump in the road, but I think this will definitely um, get it back on track. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And of course, the big question is whether we're going to watch it in colour and black and white, because they obviously have animated it for both. And um, all seven episodes, including the existing episode, has an animated version as well. So I'm going to, Charlie, col what are you going to do first? Watch the colour version or the black and white version? That's the big question. Usually I do watch the um, colour version just because, you know, it's more colours. And it's um, it just does really highlight how well they do the animation. Um, you know, because um, from the Galaxy 4 trailer, I can see it does um, look very visually striking, especially the planet. So it will be quite nice to see that. But if I were to watch it in like a, um, a marathon context, let's say, um, you know, so I just watch the Space Museum chase, Time Meddler, Galaxy 4, and then whatever animations next, I would probably watch it in black and white so I can get the experience you know, it would feel a bit jarring watching it in between black and white. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What about you, Ryan? 
I think I'm going to approach it the same way I approached um, the faceless ones, which is I'm watching black and white first. And when it gets to um, part two, I'm going to watch both versions, um, the live action version, and the animation version back to back and just okay. all black and white. And then immediately afterwards, I will check out the color version. I, I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, I'm going to repeat what I did with the faceless ones and just watch it in that sort of yeah. order. I think for me, that's like the better way of approaching it because I feel like 60s Doctor Who wasn't made in black and white and I feel like watching black and white, I feel like adds more to that mood and that atmosphere for me personally. Although I don't mind the colour versions. I mean, I think the colour versions are just a nice little added bonus. Yeah, yeah, I tend to agree. I feel like I'm undecided what I'm going to do yet. Like, I'm, I'm definitely going to watch the existing version of episode two rather than the animation because I always look at it as the actual episode will always come ahead of any animated version of it for me. Um, so even if I watch like all the other color episodes, I'll still watch the black and white episode too because it's an existing episode. Um, so it's really just whether I'm going to watch black or white or color around it. But um, I haven't really decided yet. So I guess you guys have to wait for the next podcast and find out what I decided to do um, because I, I can't decide right now. So I'll just have to see how I feel when I get it, I think, um, and make a decision from there. Um, so I think that pretty much is all we can say at the moment about Evil of the Daleks. Of course, in a couple of weeks, once we, I think we're all getting a copy of it, aren't we? That's the plan, I think, isn't it? Again, the steel book, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, already um, pre ordered already been done ages ago. Yeah. The minute it was announced, already got me ordering. <laughs> Same for you, Charlie. Got it got getting a copy? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Me too. I'm gonna be getting the steel book. So um it'll be good to get hold of that. In a couple of weeks we will be able to break down, discuss the animation itself, um, whether it lives up to the story and also have a chat about the story itself as well, because we've all never been able to enjoy a visual version of this story. So it'll be really great fun to chat about that. Uh, but of course, the other animation which we got announced just this week, I think we we discussed it on the previous podcast because it had actually leaked on a website. Um, although the website originally said that Galaxy 4, which is this a newly announced animation, was going to be released on the 8th of November. It's actually going to be the 15th of November this year, so a week later than, than what was on that for whatever reason. Uh, the four episode story, of course, the first William Hartnell animation um, since 2013, which I find quite remarkable. And 10th, 10th Planet Episode 4, when they released that, I think it was October 2013, somewhere around then is the last Hartnell animation we've had. And so to wait, you know, nearly, well, what, eight years between animations is, is a shame in some ways, but it's great that they finally have kind of taken the plunge because I always get the impression that they were just, like, unsure whether it would sell as well. And I feel like Galaxy 4 is probably quite a good, like, test subject for some of the William Hartnell stories because it's not a particularly well-regarded story. It's not got a famous monster in it. In many ways, it's a bit of a nothingy story that for only for really uber fans are we really interested in it. So it's going to be really interesting to see what, well, I guess, unfortunately, we'll probably never know what sort of, you know, selling figures they this this really is a cheese but i'm sure it will inform their sort of decision making down the line and i mean i i personally would quite like to see almost like one animation team work on second doctor stories and the other animation team work on first doctor stories just so we like gradually bring them both out rather than doing it all in one and then all in the other chunk that i feel like would be a more balanced way to do it um but yeah so galaxy 4 there was a teaser this week i think a 15 second or so clip um when it was 30 seconds i can't remember which showed kind of the landscape of whatever planet it was uh, what what planet is is galaxy 4 the planet i can't actually remember um can we re can we remember it's been a long time since i listened to yeah. the audio of that yeah. so it's been I might have to go, I'm going to have to google it i'm a bad fan i'm going to have to google this um but we <laughs> saw we saw the landscape of the planet um, while I give this to Google. Uh, so, Charlie, I think you 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 were somewhat unsure about um, seeing this teaser quite, you know, what to expect from the animation. So what, what were your thoughts based on this little clip? I thought um, the first scene when um, it was those ships or whatever in space looked um, really quite bad. I think it looked really uh, quite janky and... I don't know, a bit stop motiony at times, um, which I found really strange when compared to the later part of the trailer when it shows the landscape of the planet and it actually looks really nice. Like they make good use of colour, which I don't know, is a bit strange considering it's black and white usually, but um, it does look really quite nice and I have quite high hopes for this. Yeah, I think it's it's a good opportunity to take on a story that people don't know a lot about really and quite frankly wasn't very visually impressive it's a pretty pretty basic set that they used on this story back in the day 
Um, and so to, 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 to enhance it with the visuals, I think, is a great opportunity there. It was intriguing, wasn't it, Ryan, that we didn't see any of the main cast in this little teaser. I don't know if they haven't quite reached that stage of it or whether they were trying to hide something. I don't know. It just felt a bit odd that you didn't trail it by showing the first Doctor, because I feel like he's really the biggest selling point of this mm. release. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, th uh, that part does have me a little bit nervous of the fact that we haven't seen any of the characters. I mean, I... That I'm just really curious about how they're going to animate them. Hopefully, it isn't going to end as badly as what happened with them, Web of Fear. Hopefully not, fingers crossed. Um, uh, but art-wise, it does look more visually striking. It, watching the 30 second trailer, while I agree some movements look a bit janky, it didn't worry me to the extent that I was worried with the Web of Fear when they announced it. So I have some faith that this will be at least a better animation than that but if this is going to be done by a different production team, i don't know if it's the same production team that did fury from the deep i'm not entirely sure but if it's the same yes, team it, that, is. it is then i will have some faith that it will be a decent animation it's just whether or not um uh, the if they can get the animation movements right or if the limbs of the characters aren't as elongated as they were in Fury from the Deep. Well, indeed, yes. The the long arm syndrome is, 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 the, is the main concern probably for Galaxy 4 animation, isn't it? Um... But yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting. I, I I do think it's a good it's a good first sort of delve into the Hartnell era for it. Um, I, I'm hopeful that it will be good, and I think that you know mixing it in with we've obviously got one existing episode, Airlock, which was discovered in 2011, I think something along those lines. Like there used to be none of it really, um, and we've got a six minute clip from I think episode two as well. Um, so that's episode three, Airlock. And so there's a lot of visual material there for the anim for the animation team to work from to create some more realistic sets, but also a bit of artistic license can also be used as well. Um, and only a four episode story because it's so it's, it's in many ways, you know, it's one of the shorter animations we've had. We had Macro Terror at four parts, but most of the other ones have been six parts, haven't they? apart from Evil, that was seven. Um, so I guess maybe they may not have to do it a bit quicker or... I don't know. Maybe there'll be more quality to it because it's shorter. I don't know. Maybe that's a bit of a bit of a um, optimistic way of looking at it uh, when it comes to Galaxy Four. But I think it's it's just exciting that we're getting Hartnell animations because it's something that I think I've been wanting for the last two or three years. When they got in such a full flow with Troughton, it just seemed an obvious thing to do, especially when you look at season three and the amount of stories that are missing in season three. Like it's pretty pretty sad frankly um how much of that is lacking and so i feel like they need to get started now on you know putting it all together obviously the the ultimate will be if we ever get a dalek master plan um and that's that's the dream but whether it actually happens who who, who knows um i would like to see it down the line uh, but in terms of the actual story of galaxy 4 i know we've said it's not that great but have either of you ever like watched what there is of it um to be able to enjoy i don't know charlie have you ever like really looked into it very much as a story I have seen the odd clip. I haven't watched any of the recons or listened to the audio or anything, no. but I have watched the odd clip. Um, yeah, I, I can see why lots of people don't regard it as one of the very best. Um, the Chumblies do look a bit weird. Although um, <laughs> there is obviously Peter Capaldi, who's always wanted the Chumblies to come back, as you were saying last time, Ryan. Indeed. Um, um, so I just you know, thought of that the entire time. But um, yeah, I can definitely tell why people think that it's not a very good story. And I also Googled um, the planet is never named. Great. It's just in, Gal it's just in Galaxy 4, I believe. Um, so yeah, well, there we go. It's, you know, good old Doctor Who planets that are never named in stories. It's probably, it's probably named in the target, it's probably named in the target novelization, but probably not on the, in the actual story, I imagine. Um, so yeah, that's just really something we're going to get an animation of it. Obviously alongside it, we're going to get, you know, the episode three, um, that exists. We'll get the surviving clip because I think all four episodes are being animated, aren't they? Um, the same in color and black and white, all four episodes, the kind of standard now really as much as, and that sounds bad to say, like, you know, we expect it, but that is how they do it now, don't they? They give us everything in black and white and color. It's, it's brilliant, frankly. Um, and we've got the surviving clip from episode one. You've got the reconstructions for the other episodes as well and the audio commentary. Now, I know they're doing a making of documentary, which is being done by Chris Chapman, one of the best documentary makers for Doctor Who, um, the Blu-ray range. So I'm very excited about that. He was tweeting about it the other day. He's done a 40 minute, I think it's about 40 minute making of, um, of course, he did things like our Sarah Jane, Showman, 
um I mean, he's done many documentaries uh doctor cookbook i think he did among other things so he's he he's one of the best guys who works on it so i'm really excited what he can do with a with the making of particularly when if you think about it like there's there can't be many cast members and crew who are really still around sadly because this was made such a long time ago like it's it must be a challenge to put together a making documentary when you've got so few existing people sadly to be able to talk to don't you guys think yeah definitely it's i mean it's definitely a miracle that he's getting putting all of this together frankly and um the fact and again the fact that he's um uh putting together this documentary hopefully it'll give me a better understanding of galaxy Four. give me like a new appreciation of it i mean if anyone could do it it's chris chapman um i mean it's i mean i thought galaxy Four it was fine but it's just not i think the problem is it's just not very memorable i think there is a it is a good like, sort of race against time story where you have to solve this before the planet blows up kind yes. of thing. But the problem yeah. is you throw in the fact that the main threats are just these, this very small selection of, of this sort of uh, s- strange women with big goods and they're led by with these chumblies as well, which, yes. I mean, what else is there to say about the chumblies that hasn't already been said? I mean, I know Peter Capaldi's a fan and, and he also wanted to, and funny enough, he wanted to bring back the Zabi from the web from yeah. the web planet. So there you go, <laughs> says yeah. everything. But then again, he he did help bring back the Mondasian Cybermen and made them the best Cybermen ever. So yeah, at least there was something that it, it shows that his fandom did pay off in the end. Um, exactly. And so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping this animation and this documentary that Chris Chapman's put together. I'm hoping that it, at least improves my experience from galaxy um so yeah i think as you say ryan it's it's imp- we hope that this version of galaxy Four will just kind of you know maybe bring a new audience to it bring a new appreciation for it as a story by being able to actually Im- see a visual version of the whole story and maybe what seemed like a fairly bland and uninteresting story in the midst of of the hartnell era might just be that that bit more exciting when introduced with vibrant colors and, and excitement um and maybe they can get peter capaldi on the documentary to talk about it as well which would be the best thing for me really you know he loves them why not just do it i mean to be fair if anybody's going to think of the idea chris chapman will think of the idea so if it isn't happened i'm sure he would have tried um but yeah we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that i know one other thing that they have there they're putting on the galaxy 4 release is a, a what they've called a, a finding galaxy 4 documentary uh so i assume that's basically just some something about how the missing the episode 3 was recovered and maybe the clip as well um which is always interesting to to, to find out about i always enjoy learning the stories behind you know episodes being recovered and story being recovered i think that's always really really interesting so um i imagine that'll be a shorter you know like a 10 15 minute sort of featurette basically but it's still interesting to just learn that that bit more about how how quite remarkably often these these sort of singular episodal stories are, are recovered it's, it's it's really quite incredible so overall guys i think you know we would we probably all agree we're looking forward to evil of the daleks more than galaxy 4 yeah absolutely i mean what what's the options um the daleks or the chumblies i mean i think the answer is fairly obvious <laughs> yeah it, it might be true I, t- I think you tend to agree don't you charlie yeah, I think um, although um, Enemy of the World, people thought it was a bit of a rubbish one when it was just episode three, and now it's one of the most highly reg- regarded stories ever. That's I'm not true. saying it will happen with Galaxy 4, but it might go up a bit in people's appreciation. I, I feel like there will be a general more positivity about it than there has ever been, partially because there's now an animation of it, but I feel like just more people will see it and think about it as a story because we've got an animation. So I feel like maybe not as much as any of the world went up because yeah as you say Charlie that that really shot from this story's rubbish don't care about it so actually wow this is one of the best of the Patrick Trails and era um, I don't think it's quite going to be up with you know Dalek Master Plan is one of the best of um, uh, Hartnell's era but I think it'll still be much improved don't you think Ryan? Yeah and I'm hoping that'll be the case I'm hoping that it'll definitely boost up in people's rights and get a new appreciation for it. I mean that's what I'm hoping for and hopefully it's not it doesn't end up the other way hopefully fingers crossed i mean to quote again to quote jeff goldblum from jurassic park it's it's like it all starts with ooh and ha but then all then later on it's there's the running and the screaming <laughs> <laughs> so let's hope it doesn't end up like that hopefully well, indeed we, we certainly can hope can't we we can certainly hope so 
Um, yes, Galaxy 4, the animated version, will be released on the 15th of um, November. And so it completes our little run of, of releases coming up in the autumn. We've got, obviously, in next week, Eve of the Daleks, we've got the re-release of Season 23 coming up on the 4th of October. Then, as we say, Galaxy 4 on the 15th of November. Um, then there's the strongly rumoured, which we discussed in the previous podcast, Season 17. Whether it's going to come out quite before Christmas or after, I have to say my bets on are on after. But... Um, I don't know. We'll see. It, it, uh, the, that that website we discussed last time was the thirteenth of December. Um, I think we had a quick chat about this beforehand, didn't we, Ryan? And we we kind of decided actually it's probably more likely it's going to be after Christmas than turn up about ten days before Christmas, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, if season twenty six is anything to go by, it seems like more likely it's going to come around January or February rather than just before Christmas. I mean, I think that is. It is pretty insane to try and get it out just before then. But then again, um, season 19 came out about two or three weeks before Christmas. So yeah, true. anything possible at this point. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Exactly. And, and you know, it will just be good to get another clip. I think it'd be a little bit of a shame, even though I know it doesn't really matter. But if technically in the year 2021, there are only two collection releases, if we get season 18, we had season 18 in March and season 24 in June, I think it'd be slightly a shame if we only end up with two actually in this calendar year. Um, but then if you if if ultimately like 17 ends up being released like the second week of January or something, I feel like it's still possible that we'll get three releases next year because I know that's what they're targeting. Um, if we well, I guess technically if we got four releases next year, if we get one in the beginning of January, then say one in April, one in August and one in November. Like, I don't feel like that's impossible. Um, and, you know, as I, I was reading just today, I think Chris Chapman was, you know, as, as he does on his Twitter, he loves to tease stuff to do with the Doctor Blu-ray range, was talking about how he was already prepping for another, like, three different documentaries, I think. Um, or, like, bio, biopic documentaries, you know, sort of about a person or something like that. I think he was already in the planning stage for all of that. So that suggests that, you know, at the very least, there's lots and lots of plans afoot. I think we can be fairly confident that there's a season 20 in there at some point down the line. Um, given that, you know, both Janet Fielding and Peter Davison strongly implied they filmed a documentary about two years ago uh, where they went to Amsterdam. Um, wasn't it like a trip to a convention in Amsterdam or something, I think, um, which sounds really, really interesting. So that'll be something to look forward to as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, are you, are you hopeful, Charlie, that we're going to, you know, keep the pace of the collection range and, you know, have hopefully three or four releases next year and not, you know, obviously COVID pushed it back a little bit, but hopefully we doesn't sort of lose too much momentum going forwards. Uh, yeah, I'd like to hope so. As you said, um, it will be quite disappointing if we do just get two this year, those being eight and 24. But, um, you know, next year, you know, four might not be out of the question. Who knows? I mean, uh, like you said, if um, let's say we do get season 17 in January, you know, that still does leave time for three more. I'd assume after 17, probably 20. Yeah. And as much as I want like season seven or season 13, I'd imagine... 25 and then maybe another Pertwee one like I don't know 9 or 11 probably yeah exactly I think the the key will be when they finally decide to open up the black and white era and start releasing seasons one to six because because at the moment you know there's only about was it like three or four seasons of the 80s left to release isn't it because it's 20 21 22 and 25 so four left that's it that's all we've got so that's going to run out pretty quickly um if they keep releasing them and you know there's only so many tom baker ones you can release obviously there's a few john Pertwee's left as well but at some point they're going to have to tackle the the black and white ones i know they keep saying they're not avoiding doing them but i also feel like they kind of are to an extent because otherwise we've you know we've had nine now you feel like one of them would have been a black and white one if they were wanting to kind of balance it and do them all rather than wait that little bit longer for them I mean, although I wouldn't rule out the possibility of a Wilderness Years box set with Paul mm. McGann's um, um, the, the TV movie included in there. I, who knows if they decide to do that as well to kind of fill out the time. And and the fact that he, I would still say that Paul McGann is a classic doctor. He does yeah. fit in with a classic doctor. So uh, I hope I wouldn't be surprised if they would also give him his own collection range and then and that they do the wilderness years as a way of completing that classic set. Although you never know, maybe they decide to surprise us and do the modern Doctor Who as part of the collection range. I mean, I hope they do it. I just kind of hope they wait until they finish Classic Who before they do it. 
because I don't want the classic series collection to be pushed back any further. Some of the seasons, particularly the black and white seasons, like, do it. I want them to do it. I want them to do it for New Who, but wait until that's done. And then by then, there'll probably be 15 seasons of New Who you can do as well. So it's easy to kind of spread that around as well. And, and, and there'll be distance between the series in terms of when they aired. And, and all of that will hopefully come into play with these things. But um, so that's, yeah, I hope for... Um, what we might get around Christmas or the start of the new year with season 17. So lots of releases to come up. Uh, one random thing I just wanted to talk about, which I can relate to actually with something we just spoke about, which is season 20 now to the dam. I, the other week, talking of stories that we've seen, I watched Ark of Infinity for the first time. Um, and I don't know. It's just kind of bad, isn't it? It's not, it's not really very good. Like it's, it's a quite, it's not very exciting. I feel like it's the most dull Gallifrey story. I know people don't like Gallifrey stories. I love Gallifrey stories, but like mm. Gallifrey feels like a big deal in Deadly Assassin and in even Invasion of Time. But it feels like nothing in Ark of Infinity. It's like, oh, okay, we're on Gallifrey, cool. And then we just leave it halfway through the last episode and couldn't even care less. It's like It feels like it's so just devalued as, as the Doctor's home planet in such a significant place, which is just crazy, frankly. Um, I don't know, guys, I think, Charlie, have you seen Ark of Infinity? Can you try and convince me it's not as bad as it was? I saw, um, so I brought a few stories with me on holiday. I went to Wales over the summer holidays and I was on season 20 of my marathon and I brought with me Ark of Infinity, Terminus and the King's Demons, three of the most infamous oh. Peter oh, Nation's stories ever. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't mind Ark of Infinity as, as much as most. But it's still quite bad. I mean, the um, the starting and you know the the first episode and the final episode. I'd say the best, but in the middle, oh my goodness! And the weird chicken monster. I can't even remember what oh, it's called. What, what 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 is that? Like, what's the point? He he has no. He serves no purpose. He just zaps a couple of the 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 really terrible actors playing sort of like students in Amsterdam or oh yeah the, Tegan's um backpack, Tegan's yeah, cousin, cousin or yeah, yeah. Who, yeah. and his friend who are backpackers or something in Amsterdam mm. who I'm sorry but they were they were awful actors um, yeah they're just the performances are terrible I, d I don't know why it seems to be such a struggle to do just a such a simple role just be a normal like young mm. person is it that hard oh, but I don't know it's just pretty bad. Yeah, instead of being backed by a demonic roadrunner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my it, it God. Just, and it, it's just the most, like, tenuous plot as well. Like, it's so coincidental to get Tegan back into the story. It's ridiculous. Like, she just so happened to be meeting a cousin in Amsterdam who just so happened to go and stay in this, like, crypt under underneath some building that happens to be where Omega is based, aka famous Time Lord who was stuck in the Antimatter universe, who happens to be something to do with some big plot line to do with Gallifrey. It's just the most <laughs> ridiculous coincidental mess that I've ever watched. Yeah, I absolutely 100% agree with you, Elliot. I mean, I I watched this, like, a few months ago, and it it's just off. It's one of the worst 80s... Well, one of the worst Doctor Who stories in general, for all the reasons you just said, it's just coincidence after coincidence. They take a great villain from the three Doctors, who I yeah. think is a fascinating oh, yeah. multi-layered villain, and they just turn him into just a bland, generic bad guy. They just throw him in for no reason. And yes, demonic roadrunners involved for no reason whatsoever. Um, bad acting. Um, yeah, Gallifrey is just sort of wasted. They blame the doctor for no reason. He <laughs> seemingly got killed, and then, um, but yeah, he somehow survives that through Omega's powers or whatever. It's never yep. fully explained, and yep. and yeah, it's just it's just really bad. And I mean, the only two things I do, there's only two positives, only two, which just goes to show just how bad the story is. Um, is that it did surprise the first with. Colin Baker showing up. I didn't think he was that bad as the commander. I thought it for the role, granted, it was a very one-dimensional character. There wasn't much yeah. to it, but for the role he had to play, I thought Colin Baker did a pretty good job. And and as much as I Peter Davison is my least favourite doctor, and I don't think he's that his doctor's that interesting. I will admit I did like Peter Davison's performance as Omega in the brief mm. three four minutes he was yeah. in at the very end. Um, but that's, yeah, that's it. That's all I can think of in terms of positives. It's just, and the fact that it's coming on after 
time flight because this comes in after time flight. Yeah. I mean, with those two together, it is the double bill from hell. It really yeah. is. And it's of like, course, didn't didn't they release the two stories together on the DVD range in a box yeah. set as well? Yeah. Yeah. How about that? Well, the best box set ever, the double bill from hell. It's it's pretty much classic Doctor Who's um Love of Monsters and Fear Her. I yeah, mean yeah. nowadays people think of those two as like um the double bill monstrosity. Even though I looking back, Love and Monsters isn't that bad. I mean it's not yeah. great. I mean, it's still not what I look for in Doctor Who, no. but it was an it was an interesting idea nonetheless. Um and it's definitely way better than Fear Her and the uh, the, the, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's definitely better than Ark of Infinity. I mean, next to that, Love and Monsters looks like a masterpiece in comparison to Ark of Infinity and Time Flight. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was doing that a, a marathon in the run-up to the 50th anniversary. I was doing like a marathon of Classic Dot 2. And when it got to that point, I was struggling to get through them. It really was an absolute slog. And I just thought... I might have to bail on this. I just can't take this anymore. It was, it drove me mad. I mean, there's that famous internet meme of um, uh, Charlie Day from uh, The Office and looking all scraggly and disheveled from all the poster boards and everything, the stickers he puts up. That's how I felt at the end of Time Flight and Arc Infinity. It was just, yeah, what else is there to say? (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's it's it was it was a real struggle like i was excited going into it i know it had a bad reputation but it's a gallifrey story that i'd never seen before and i love gallifrey stories so i really was like looking forward to that aspect of it but then it just just was so underwhelming as a gallifrey story and as any story like there's there's all these these sort of slightly bizarre plot lines into it and you're right you reminded me ryan of the ending of the, the, the like five minutes of fairly unexciting shots of peter davis and azomi go running around becoming more and more you know um, ill and dying, whatever, and, and which and is he just goes a back bit. Into the Omega Act uh, again. He, I mean, in the last few shots, it's not Peter Davison; it's um, the the Omega Act, of which for some reason yes. I don't yes. know why they did that. It's, it's just so yeah, yeah. It's what else is there to say? It's, it just I just cannot believe how bad it is. And I know people criticise Hell Bent for um, not being about Gallifrey when it should be, and all the yeah all that talk about it. While I I do have my own problems with Hellbent, it did, it looks like a masterpiece. Again, it just looks like a well-constructed piece, piece of art in comparison to Ark of Infinity, which just, yeah. I just couldn't believe how bad it was. And I mean, but yeah, I mean, at least shortly afterwards, we had stories like Snake Dance and Enlightenment to help. Yeah. Wash all that I'm Modern Undead's not bad as well, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Um, but yeah, I think season 20 is probably the, the weakest of Davison, isn't it? It's 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 just a bad way to start a season as well, which is also not ideal about Arc Infinity. Um yeah, Peter Davison himself said that he wasn't yeah. happy with his second season for various reasons, yeah. which he said was mostly budget related incidents. Yeah. Um yeah. and in a way it's isn't hard to see why looking at some of the quality of yeah some of these stories indeed yeah exactly it's it yeah i i i'm not going to rush to watch arc of infinity again i watched it on a marathon i think the next time i watch it will be in another marathon or when season 20 gets a collection release um i yeah i don't think there's going to be much other reason to watch it anytime soon um have you guys watched any stories recently uh any you know exciting classic stories or anything like that apart from the animations and the like that we've been doing well i th- when there was the rumor announced that season 17 was game release i decided to dip back into season 17 just a little bit which was quite a journey um i've just finished creature from the pit and which is the most immersed story to talk about which i still can't talk about without laughing for well if you watch the story then you pretty yep. much know why it is it's Indeed. a struggle to talk to them without laughing um i think it's a story that transcends good and bad. Usually when we say this is a good story, this is yeah. a bad story. I don't think Creature of the Pit, Creature from the Pit is anything. It's fascinating to look at. It's it's such a weird entity. Anyway, people say I'm pretty sure film fans will know so there's a film, infamously bad film, The Room, at which they say it's a film that transcends good and bad. 
this is the Doctor Who equivalent of that creature from the pit. Yeah. It's just, it's is it good? No. Did I have a blast watching it? Yes. And and I think that's just worth it. And I'm, and what else is there to sum up the story than seeing uh, Tom Baker grabbing the end of that Indeed. thing, and giving it a damn good blow. <laughs> It's just yeah. yeah, it's 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 one of the mo- those moments in Doctor Who where you can't quite believe <laughs> that they kind of allowed it to go on screen, mm. almost like the producers yeah. sat there and thought we can get away with. Well, maybe, maybe they didn't think they could get away with it, but the fact they thought we can get away with that. In many ways, it, I, I, it, although it's not the same kind of inappropriate nature, I look at it the same way as the terrible joke in re- in resolution about the Wi-Fi, um, mm. with with these pointless characters and the most unfunny, ridiculous joke in the most bizarre time within an episode where I'm like several producers sat down, watched that and went, yeah, that's great. Let's keep that in the episode when you can easily cut it out. So it's just moments like that in Doctor Who history where I'm like, how the heck did the production team watch this and think we should keep that in the show? I bet Tom Baker did that on purpose. I bet yeah. that wasn't, I bet he did that on purpose just to look about and they just put it in anyway. I think it's the perfect definition of a troll episode. And I think it's just it's just trolling at us the whole time, this story. I believe it's intentional in its in its trolling. And th- there's even the bit with him and the astrologist guy oh, in yeah, the cave yeah, yeah. talking about the, the monster and Tom Baker's like, how big is it? And the astrologer just deeply in emphasis on huge. And Tom Baker's like, huge, how huge? 100 feet, maybe two. Huge, and they put this huge emphasis on the word huge, and I'm just like, stop saying it. And it's just, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Tom Baker did that on purpose. I think he must have saw it and just like, I'm just gonna have an absolute yeah. blast with this. <laughs> yeah, and I and I feel like it's the one season with obviously Douglas Adams' as script hesitant where he could get away with it as well. Like he mm. had such a like command on the show and almost like control over the show, frankly, that he could get away with doing things like that with no you know, repercussions or discussions, you just do it and get away with it. So I think, yeah, that's the challenge. But no, Grease from the Prit, I think, as you said, Ryan, it's a good barometer of a Doctor Who, of a Doctor Who story. It doesn't matter how good it is, you know, in inverted commas. It's, it's about whether you enjoy watching it. I think if you enjoy watching it, then that's, that's, that's it. That's, that's great. Like I, The Five Doctors is not the best Doctor Who story ever, but it's probably one of the most fun Doctor Who stories to watch ever. Like, I love yeah. it. Even if like as a plot or if you dig dug into it, sure, it doesn't all hold up. It's not all perfect but that doesn't matter so I, I i think that that's that is so much more important about whether we enjoy these stories and i think creature in the pit as ridiculous as some of it is it also can be a very enjoyable story and you know when uh, hopefully the season 17 box that comes around i'm sure i'll give it another watch and, and get some enjoyment out of it as well um that's gonna be yeah. i'm curious to know what you're going to think about about it then i mean it's kind of like how some film fans sort of defend the 2019 film version of cats is uh, it's a it's a bizarre nightmare of a film, but it's such a weird, fascinating one that you just can't help but have a blast watching it. And that's yeah. how I feel about Creature from the Pit. It's such yeah. a it's such a bizarre nightmare that it, someone should have stopped this during production. And yet I'm so glad that they didn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think I think that sums it up. We 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 would be worse off if Creature from the Pit hadn't been made. You know, it's it's an addition. It's a good addition to Doctor Who history, even if it's not the perfect Absolutely. story. Absolutely. Um, and the special yeah. feature behind the scenes of how they made that monster is oh, one of the best special yeah. features in Doctor Who history, without yeah. a doubt. Get the creep from the Pit DVD if you haven't. It's it's a great feature on there, explaining in detail how they came up with that idea and some of the drawings. And it's it's great. It's great fun. Uh, well, Charlie, what stories have you been watching recently? I've been watching, obviously, the most um, you know well loved. Um, absolutely classic story that being the two doctors it, oh, yes <laughs> it's uh it's that's very my dad, in- that's my dad's least favorite doctor story of all time he wow. absolutely hates it it's yeah he thinks it's-, it's one of the most slowest boring doctors and i it's not quite my least favorite but it is very very low on the list maybe <laughs> second to least favorite um but yeah go ahead it's <laughs> it's um it's pretty bad it's um i've not watched much colin baker i've watched the trial of a time lord and this and that's it yeah. uh it, it's definitely my least favorite colin baker story <laughs> even worse than like mind warp and that it's yeah. oh, it, it's pretty bad um you got so many weird things like that alien 
guy who like loves food so much and there's the scene in the restaurant in spain there's the second doctor with these weird rice krispies glued to his head yeah and, oh, it's it's yeah, so it weird i mean the scenes on the space station i don't mind them like they're the better part of the story yeah. once they get to spain it just it just loses it a bit but that awful cliffhanger at the end of episode one where the doctor trips and he falls and his scarf is just there and it's it, oh yeah. I, I didn't really think like I, I wasn't really paying a whole lot of attention, but even then I thought, oh, that was the cliffhanger. That's not I wasn't really anticipating this to be the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I yeah. That alien guy, shock guy, uh, that my dad says that my dad says that's his least favorite character of the entire show because of just how repulsive it is and the fact that he serves really no purpose to the story, yeah. really. I mean, the Sontarans, who, of course, in the story, they don't serve a purpose whatsoever. And what really suffers, that story suffers most of all, is that it's loaded to the gills with padding. So many pointless scenes that could have easily been excised. I mean, it's it's practically a 25-minute a or hell, just one 45-minute dot two episode that just got stretched out to three, and it's it's such an absolute slog to get through. It it actually kind of drove me nuts. I mean, again, not my least favourite story, that honour goes to Warriors of the Deep, but this comes in a very close second. <laughs> yeah, I think it's... It, it could never be one of my least favourites because it's got Patrick Troughton and Colin Baker in it, so mm. it's always going to have something good to offer, and that is fun seeing them, and Jamie as well, along with Perry. It's, there's, you know, there's... That I do like all the dynamics, and there is some really good stuff in there. But as you as you say, the underlying thing is it's way too long. That's the most. That's the number one thing. I mean, I've watched it for ages, but that's the number one thing I remember was it's just it's three forty five minute episodes. Like that's just too long. Like sure, that's the same as six twenty five minute episodes, but this is not a story that could sustain a six twenty five minute episodes. Like that's never going to happen. So, yeah, that's a real struggle. Um, and as you say, the stuff in Spain, it just feels a bit like, oh, well, we got the budget to go to Spain. How exciting. Let's just fill it with shots of Spain constantly and all the exciting <laughs> things without really any interest in there. Just have some Torrens walk around Spain and, and that's it. So, yeah, it's, it's a I bit think of a, I think there's a great, someone summed up this, there's a brilliant one-line review of it somewhere. I can't remember what it was, but someone said, it's an episode of Last of the Summer Wine sponsored by the Vegetarian Society. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> perfect summarization really oh that's brilliant that's brilliant yeah it's 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 a bit of a struggle to get through sometimes isn't it really um but well i think we'll probably leave it there after our discussion of you know slating various doctor Who stories let's 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 save some more for next time we do like doctor Who stories as well even the daleks is going to be great and it's going to be great fun to watch it um and so join us in two weeks time um hopefully is the plan um to review discuss break down the animation of evil the daleks and anything else that gets announced between now and then if we're lucky enough to have another collection release or announced or whatever then we'll cover it um and as always please do check us out on twitter if you haven't already at kavam pod for all the latest information on upcoming podcasts uh we're on apple Podcasts, we're on spotify obviously on my youtube channel ems productions so you can always find us and check us out anywhere but apart from that we'll be back again in a couple of weeks to discuss it with the lights but from now from me from ryan from charlie it's goodbye